Hi there, and welcome to the Cotswold Explorer Christmas Ghost Stories. I'm having such a lot of fun reading these. I found them in all kinds of wonderful places. The Victorians really loved their Christmas ghost stories, and this one is perfect for us. It's called Mr. Huffam. It's written by Hugh Walpole. Now, Hugh Walpole um, was called Sir Hugh Seymour Walpole. He was born in 1884 in Auckland, in New Zealand, um, but to English parents. I'm going to read you the, the, this lovely introduction to him that, that comes just before the story in this book. He spent his childhood in New York and at various English boarding schools. He was related to two important Gothic writers, Horace Walpole, who wrote the first Gothic novel, The Castle of Otranto, in 1764, and Richard Harris Barham, author of The Ingoldsby Legends. He became a prolific novelist himself, publishing his most famous book, Rogue Herries, an historical novel set near his home in Cumbria in 1930. He was shocked that same year when his friend, Somerset Maugham, included a satirical portrait of him in the novel Cakes and Ale, saying, I could think of no one among my contemporaries who had achieved so considerable a position on so little talent. It wasn't a very friendly thing for his friends to have said. This shook his confidence, not surprisingly, and he wrote rather sadly in his diary in 1935, shall I have any lasting reputation? Like every author in history who has seriously tried to be an artist, I sometimes consider the question. Fifty years from now, I think the Lake stories will still be read locally. Otherwise, I shall be mentioned in a small footnote to my period in literary history. However, he was admired by writers including Arnold Bennett, Clements Dane, J.B. Priestley and Joseph Conrad, and he was a close friend of Virginia Woolf. He was in a long-term relationship until his death with a former policeman called Harold Cheevers, who was known officially at the time as his chauffeur. Mr. Huffam, which is this story that I'm about to read you, is a classic Christmas ghost story which draws on the Victorian tradition and is light-hearted and warming rather than terrifying. So here it is. It's called Mr. Huffam by Hugh Walpole. Once upon a time, it doesn't matter when it was, except that it was long after the Great War, young Tubby Winslow was in the act of crossing Piccadilly, just below Hatchard's bookshop. It was three days before Christmas, and there had been a frost, a thaw, and then a frost again. The roads were treacherous, traffic nervous and irresponsible, while against the cliff-like interference of brick and mortar, a thin, faint snow was falling from a primrose-coloured sky. Soon it would be dusk and the lights would come out. Then things would be more cheerful. It would, however, take more than lights to restore Tubby's cheerfulness. Rubicund of face, and alarmingly stout of body for a youth of 23, he had just then the spirit of a damp face towel. For only a week ago, Diana Lane Fox had refused to consider for a moment the possibility of marrying him. I like you, Tubby, she'd said. I think you have a kind heart, but marry you? You are useless, ignorant and greedy. You're disgracefully fat, and your mother worships you. He had not known, until Diana refused him, how bitterly alone he would find himself. He had money, friends, a fine roof above his head. He had seemed to himself popular wherever he went. Why, there's old Tubby, everyone had cried. It was true that he was fat. It was true that his mother adored him. He had not, until now, known that these were drawbacks. 
He had seemed to himself until a week ago the friend of all the world. Now he appeared a pariah. Diana's refusal of him had been a dreadful shock. He had been quite sure that she would accept him. She had gone with him gladly to dances and the pictures. She had, it seemed, approved highly of his mother, Lady Winslow, and his father, Sir Roderick Winslow, Bart. She had partaken again and again of the Winslow hospitality. All, it seemed to him, that was needed was for him to say the word. He could choose his time. Well, he had chosen his time. At the Harris's dance last Wednesday evening. And this was the result. He had expected to recover. His was naturally a buoyant nature. He told himself again and again that there were many other fish in the matrimonial sea, but it appeared that there were not. He wanted Diana, and only Diana. He halted at the resting place halfway across the street and sighed so deeply that a lady with a little girl and a fierce-looking chow dog looked at him severely, as though she would say, Now this is Christmas time, a gloomy period for all concerned. It is an unwarranted impertinence for anyone to make it yet more gloomy. There was someone else clinging to this small fragment of security. A strange-looking man. His appearance was so unusual that Tubby forgot his own troubles in his instant curiosity. The first unusual thing about this man was that he had a beard. Beards were then very seldom worn. Then his clothes, although they were clean and neat, were most certainly old-fashioned. He was wearing a high, sharp-pointed collar, a black stock with a jewelled tie pin, and a most remarkable waistcoat, purple in colour and covered with little red flowers. He was carrying a large, heavy-looking brown bag. His face was bronzed, and he made Tubby think of a retired sea captain. But the most remarkable thing of all about him was the impression that he gave of restless, driving energy. It was all that he could do to keep quiet. His strong, wiry figure seemed to burn with some secret fire. The traffic rushed madly past, but at every moment when there appeared a brief interval between the cars and the omnibuses, this bearded gentleman with the bag made a little dance, and once he struck the chow with his bag, and once nearly thrust the small child into the road. The moment came when, most unwisely, he darted forth. He was almost caught by an imperious, disdainful Rolls Royce. The lady gave a little scream, and Tubby caught his arm, held him, and drew him back. That nearly had you, sir, Tubby murmured, his hand still on his arm. The stranger smiled, a most charming smile that shone from his eyes, his beard, his very hands. I must thank you, he said, bowing with old-fashioned courtesy. But damn it, as the little boy said to the grocer, there's no end to the dog, as he saw the sausages coming from the sausage machine. At this, he laughed very heartily, and Tubby had to laugh too, although the remark didn't seem to him very amusing. The traffic's very thick at Christmas time, Tubby said. Everyone doing their shopping, you know. The stranger nodded. Splendid time, Christmas, he said. Best of the year. Oh, do you think so, said Tubby. I doubt if you'll find people to agree with you. It isn't the thing to admire Christmas these days. Not the thing, said the stranger, amazed. Why, what's the matter? This was a poser because so many things were the matter, from unemployment to Diana. Tubby was saved for the moment from answering. Now there's a break, he said. We can cross now. Cross they did, the stranger swinging his body as though at any instant he might spring right off the ground. Which way are you going? Tubby asked. It astonished him afterwards when he looked back and remembered this question. It was not his way to make friends of strangers. 
his theory being that everyone was out to do everyone, in these days especially. Tell you the truth, I don't quite know, the stranger said. I've only just arrived. Where have you come from, asked Tubby. The stranger laughed. I've been moving about for a long time. I'm always on the move. I'm considered a very restless man by my friends. They were walking along very swiftly, for it was cold and the snow was falling fast now. Tell me, said the stranger, about its being a bad time. What's the matter? What was the matter? What a question. Tubby murmured, why, everything's the matter. Unemployment, no trade, you know. No, I don't. I've been away. I think everyone looks very jolly. I say, don't you feel cold without an overcoat? Tubby asked. Oh, that's nothing, the stranger answered. I'll tell you when I did feel cold, though. When I was a small boy, I worked in a factory, putting labels onto blacking bottles. It was cold then. Never known such cold. Icicles would hang on the end of your nose. No, said Tubby. They did, I assure you, and the blacking bottles would be coated with ice. By this time, they'd reached Barclay Street. The Winslow Mansion was in Hill Street. I turn up here, said Tubby. Oh, do you? The stranger looked disappointed. He smiled and held out his hand. Then Tubby did another extraordinary thing. He said... Come in and have a cup of tea. Our place is only five yards up the street. Certainly, the stranger said. Delighted. As they walked up Barclay Street, he went on confidentially. I haven't been in London for a long time. All these vehicles are very confusing. But I like it. I like it immensely. It's so lively. And then the town's so quiet compared with what it was when I lived here. Quiet, said Tubby. Certainly. There were cobbles, and the carts and drays screamed and rattled like the damned. But that's years ago. Yes, <laughs> I'm older than I look. Then, pointing, he added, But that's where Dorchester House was. So they pulled it down. What a pity. Oh, everything's pulled down now, said Tubby. I acted there once. A grand night we had. Are you fond of acting? Oh, I'd be no good, said Tubby modestly. Too self-conscious. Ah, you mustn't be self-conscious, said the stranger. Thinking of yourself only breeds trouble, as the man said to the hangman just before they dropped him. Isn't that bag a terrible weight, Tubby asked. I've carried worse things than this, said the stranger. I carried a four-poster once, all the way from one end of the Marshall Sea to the other. They were outside the house now, and Tubby realised for the first time his embarrassment. It was not his way to bring anyone into the house unannounced, and his mother would be very haughty with strangers. However, there they were, and it was snowing hard, and the poor man was without a coat, so in they went. The Winslow Mansion was magnificent, belonging in all its features to an age that was gone. There was a marble staircase, and up this the stranger almost ran, carrying his bag like a feather. Tubby toiled behind him, but was, unhappily, not in time to prevent the stranger from entering through the open doors of the drawing room. Here, seated in magnificent state, was Lady Winslow, a roaring fire encased with marble on one side of her, a beautiful tea table in front of her, and walls hung with magnificent imitations of the great masters. Lady Winslow was a massive woman with snow-white hair, a bosom like a small skating rink, and a little face that wore a look of perpetual astonishment. Her dress of black and white silk fitted her so tightly that one anticipated with pleasure the moment when she would be compelled to rise. She moved as little as possible. She said as little as possible. She thought as little as possible. She had a very kind heart and was sure that the world was going straight to the devil. The stranger put his bag on the floor 
and went over to her with his hand outstretched. How are you? he said. I'm delighted to meet you. By good fortune, Tubby arrived in the room at this moment. Mother, he began, this is a gentleman. Oh, of course, said the stranger. You don't know my name. My name's Huffam. And he caught the small, white, podgy hand and shook it. At this moment, two Pekingese dogs, one brown and one white, advanced from somewhere, violently barking. Lady Winslow found the whole situation so astonishing that she could only whisper, Now, Bobo, now, Coco. You see, Mother, Tubby went on, Mr Huffam was nearly killed by a motor car, and I rescued him, and it began to snow heavily. Yes, dear, Lady Winslow said in a queer, husky little voice that was always a surprise coming from so vast a bosom. Then she pulled herself together. For some reason, Tubby had done this amazing thing, and whatever Tubby did was right. I do hope you'll have some tea, Mr... She hesitated. Huffam, ma'am. Yes, thank you. I will have some tea. Milk and sugar? All of it, Mr Huffam laughed and slapped his knee. Yes, milk and sugar. Very kind of you indeed. A perfect stranger as I am. You have a beautiful place here, ma'am. You are to be envied. Oh, do you think so, said Lady Winslow in a husky whisper. Not in these days, not in these terrible days. Why, the taxes alone. You've no idea, Mr... Um, Huffam. Yes, how stupid of me. Now, Bobo, now, Coco. Then a little silence followed, and Lady Winslow gazed at her strange visitor. Her manners were beautiful. She never looked directly at her guests. But there was something about Mr Huffam that forced you to look at him. It was his energy. It was his obvious happiness, for happy people were so very rare. It was his extraordinary waistcoat. Mr Huffin didn't mind in the least being looked at. He smiled back at Lady Winslow as though he had known her all his life. I'm so very fortunate, he said, to find myself in London at Christmas time. And snow, too, the very thing, snowballs, Punch and Judy, mistletoe, holly, the pantomime. Nothing so good in life as a pantomime. Oh, do you think so, said Lady Winslow faintly. I can't, I'm afraid, altogether agree with you. It lasts such a very long time and is often so exceedingly vulgar. Ah, it's the sausages, said Mr Huffham, laughing. You don't like the sausages. For my part, I dote on them. I know it's silly at my age, but there it is. Joey and the sausages. <laughs> I wouldn't miss them for anything. At that moment, a tall and exceedingly thin gentleman entered. This was Sir Roderick Winslow. Sir Roderick had been once an undersecretary, once a chairman of a company, once famous for his smart and rather vicious repartees. All these were now glories of the past. He was now nothing but the husband of Lady Winslow, the father of Tubby, and the victim of an uncertain and often truculent digestion. It was natural that he should be melancholy, although perhaps not so melancholy as he found it necessary to be. Life for him was altogether without savour. He now regarded Mr Huffam, his bag and his waistcoat, with unconcealed astonishment. This is my father, said Tubby. Mr Huffam rose at once and grasped his hand. Delighted to meet you, sir, he said. Sir Roderick said nothing but, ah. Then he sat down. Tubby was suffering now from a very serious embarrassment. The odd visitor had drunk his tea and it was time that he should go, yet it seemed that he had no intention of going. With his legs spread apart, his head thrown back, his friendly eyes taking everyone in as though they were all his dearest friends, he was asking for a second cup. Tubby waited for his mother, 
She was a mistress of the art of making a guest disappear. No one knew quite how she did it. There was nothing so vulgarly direct as a glance at the clock or a suggestion as to the imminence of dressing for dinner. A cough, a turn of the wrist, a word about the dogs and the thing was done. But this guest, Tubby knew, was a little more difficult than the ordinary. There was something old-fashioned about him. He took people naively at their word. Having been asked to tea, he considered that he was asked to tea. None of your five minutes gossip and then hastening on to a cocktail party. However, Tubby reflected, the combination of father, mother and the drawing room with its marble fireplace and row of copied old masters was, as a rule, enough to ensure brief visitors. On this occasion also, it would have its effect. And then an amazing thing occurred. Tubby perceived that his mother liked Mr. Huffam, that she was smiling and even giggling, that her little eyes shone, her tiny mouth was parted in expectation as she listened to her visitor. Mr. Huffam was telling a story, an anecdote of his youth, about a boy whom he had known in his own childhood, a gay, enterprising and adventurous boy who had gone as page boy to a rich family. Mr. Huffam described his adventures in a marvellous manner, his rencontre with the second footman, who was a snob and evangelical, of how he had handed biscuits through the pantry window to his little sister, of the friendship that he had made with the cook. And as Mr. Huffam told these things, all these people lived before your eyes. The pompous mistress with her ear trumpet, the cook's husband, who had a wooden leg, the second footman, who was in love with a pastry cook's daughter. The house of this young page boy took on life and all the furniture in it, the tables and chairs, the beds and looking glasses, everything down to the very red woolen muffler that the footman wore in bed because he was subject to colds in the neck. Then Lady Winslow began to laugh, and Sir Roderick Winslow even laughed. And the butler, a big, red-faced man, coming in to remove the tea, could not believe his parboiled eyes, but stood there, looking first of all at his mistress, then at his master, then at Mr. Huffam's bag, then at Mr. Huffam himself, until he remembered his manners and with a sudden apologetic cough, set sternly, for himself this disgraceful behaviour of his employers was no laughing matter, about his proper duties. But best of all, perhaps, was the pathos at the end of Mr Huffam's story. Pathos is a dangerous thing in these days. We so easily call it sentimentality. Mr Huffam was a master of it. Quite easily and with no exaggeration, he described how the sister of the little page boy lost some money entrusted to her by her only too bibulous father, of her terror, her temptation to steal from her aged aunt's purse, her final triumphant discovery of the money in a band box. How they all held their breaths, how vividly they saw the scene, how real was the sister of the little page boy. At last the story was ended. Mr. Huffam rose. Well, ma'am, I must thank you for a very happy hour, he said. Then the most remarkable thing of all occurred. For Lady Winslow said, If you have not made other arrangements, why not stay here for a night or two? While you're looking about you, you know. I'm sure we should be delighted. Should we not, Roderick? And Sir Roderick said, Ah, ah, um, certainly. On looking back, as he so often did afterwards, into the details of this extraordinary adventure, Tubby was never able to arrange the various incidents in their proper order. The whole affair had the inconsequence, the coloured fantasy of a dream. One of those rare and delightful dreams that are so much more true and reasonable than anything in one's waking life. 
After that astounding invitation of Lady Winslow's, in what order did the events follow? The cynical luncheon party, the affair of Mallow's young woman, Mallow was the butler, the extraordinary metamorphosis of Miss Allington. All of these were certainly in the first 24 hours after Mr. Huffham's arrival. The grand sequence of the Christmas tree, the mad party, the London vision were all parts of the tremendous climax. At once, Tubby realised the house itself changed. It had never been a satisfactory house, always one of those places rebelliously determined not to live. Even the rooms most often inhabited, the drawing room, the long dusky dining room, Sir Roderick's study, Tubby's own bedroom sulkily refused to play the game. The house was too large, the furniture too heavy, the ceilings too high. Nevertheless, on the first evening of Mr. Huffham's visit, the furniture began to move about. After dinner on that evening, there was only the family present. Miss Agatha Allington, an old maid, a relation with money to be left, an unhappy old woman suffering from constant neuralgia, had not yet arrived. There they were in the drawing room, and almost at once Mr. Huffham had moved some of the chairs away from the wall, had turned the sofa with the gilt spiky back more cosily toward the fire. He was not impertinent nor officious. Indeed, on his first evening he was very quiet, asking them some questions about present-day London, making some rather odd social inquiries about prisons and asylums and the protection of children. He was interested, too, in the literature of the moment and wrote down in a little notebook an odd collection of names, for Lady Winslow told him that Ethel M. Dell, Warwick Deeping, and a lady called Wilhelmina Stitch, who wrote poetry, were her favourite writers. While Tubby suggested that he should look into the work of Virginia Woolf, D. H. Lawrence and Aldous Huxley. They had, in fact, a quiet evening, which ended with Mr. Huffham having his first lesson in bridge. He had been, he told them, when he had last tried cards, an enthusiastic whist player. It was a quiet evening, but as Tubby went up the long, dark staircase to his room, he felt that in some undefined way there was excitement in the air. Before undressing, he opened his window and looked out onto the roofs and chimney pots of London. Snow glittered and sparkled under a sky that quivered with stars. Dimly, he heard the recurrent waves of traffic as though the sea gently beat at the feet of the black, snow-covered houses. What an extraordinary man, was his last thought, before he slept. Before he had known that he would have Mr. Huffham as his guest, Tubby had invited a few of his clever young friends to luncheon. Diana, Gordon Woolley, Ferris Band, Mary Polkenhorn. Gathered round the Winslow luncheon table, Tubby regarded them with new eyes. Was it because of the presence of Mr. Huffham? He, gaily flaunting his tremendous waistcoat, was in high spirits. He had all morning been revisiting some of his old haunts. He was amazed. He could not conceal, he didn't attempt to conceal, his amazement. He gave them, as they sat there, languidly picking at their food, a slight notion of what East London had once been. The filth, the degradation, the flocks of wild, haggard-eyed, homeless children. Mary Polkinghorne, who had a figure like an umbrella handle, an eaten crop and a dye glass, gazed at him with bemused amazement. But they say our slums are awful. I haven't been down there myself, but Bunny Carlisle runs a boys' club, and he says... Mr. Huffam admitted that he had seen some slums that morning, but they were nothing, nothing at all, to the things he had seen in his youth. Who is this man? Ferris Band whispered to Diana. I don't know, she answered. Someone Tubby picked up, but I like him. And then, this Christmas. Oh dear, young Woolley sighed. Here's Christmas again, isn't it awful? 
I'm going to bed. I shall sleep and I hope dream until this dreadful time is over. Mr. Huffam looked at him in wonder. Hang up your stocking and see what happens, he said. Everyone screamed with laughter at the idea of young Woolly hanging up his stocking. Afterwards, in the drawing room, they discussed literature. I've just seen, Ferris Band explained, the proofs of Hunter's new novel. It's called Pigs in Fever. It's quite marvellous. The idea is a man has scarlet fever and it's an account of his ravings. Sheer poetry. There was a book on a little table. He picked it up. It was a first edition of Martin Chuzzlewit, bound in purple leather. Poor old Dickens, he said. Hunter has a marvellous idea. He's going to rewrite one or two of Dickens' books. Mr. Huffam was interested. Rewrite them, he asked. Yes, cut them down about to half. There's some quite good stuff in them hidden away, he says. He'll cut out all the sentimental bits, bring the humour up to date, and put in some stuff of his own. He says it's only fair to Dickens to show people that there's something there. Mr. Huffam was delighted. I'd like to see it, he said. It'll make quite a new thing of it. That's what Hunter says, Band remarked. People will be surprised. I should think they will be, Mr. Huffam remarked. The guests stayed a long time. Mr. Huffam was something quite new in their experience. Before she went, Diana said to Tubby, What a delightful man. Where did you find him? Tubby was modest. She was nicer to him than she had ever been before. What's happened to you, Tubby? she asked. You've woken up suddenly. During the afternoon, Miss Agatha Allington arrived with a number of bags and one of her worst colds. How are you, Tubby? It's kind of you to ask me. What horrible weather. What a vile thing Christmas is. You won't expect me to give you a present, I hope. Before the evening, Mr. Huffam made friends with Mallow the butler. No one quite knew how he did it. No one had ever made friends with Mallow before. But Mr. Huffam went down to the lower domestic regions and invaded the world of Mallow. Mrs. Spence, the housekeeper, Thomas, the footman, Jane and Rose, the housemaids, Maggie, the scullery maid. Mrs. Spence, who was a little round woman like a football, was a fascist in politics, said that she was descended from Mary, Queen of Scots, and permitted no one except Lady Winslow in her sitting room. But she showed Mr. Huffam the photographs of the late Mr. Spence and her son, Danley, who was a steward on the Cunard line. She laughed immeasurably at the story of the organ grinder and the lame monkey. But Mallow was Mr. Huffam's greatest conquest. It seemed, no one had had the least idea of it, that Mallow was hopelessly in love with the young lady who assisted in a flower shop in Dover Street. This young lady apparently admired Mallow very much and he had once taken her to the pictures, but Mallow was shy. No one had conceived of that. He wanted to write her a letter but simply hadn't the courage. Mr. Huffam dictated a letter for him. It was a marvellous letter, full of humour, poetry and tenderness. But I can't live up to this, sir, said Mallow. She'll find me out in no time. That's all right, said Mr. Huffam. Take her out to tea tomorrow. Be a little tender. She won't worry about letters after that. He went out after tea and returned powdered with snow in a taxi cab filled with holly and mistletoe. Oh dear, whispered Lady Winslow. We haven't decorated the house for years. I don't know what Roderick will say. He thinks Holly is so messy. I'll talk to him, said Mr. Huffam. He did, with the result that Sir Roderick came himself and assisted. Through all this, Mr. Huffam was in no way dictatorial. Tubby observed that he had even a kind of shyness, not in his opinions, for here he was very clear-minded indeed, seeing exactly what he wanted, but he seemed to be aware, by a sort of ghostly guidance, of the idiosyncrasies of his neighbours. How did he know, for instance, that Sir Roderick was afraid of a ladder? When he, Mallow, 
Tabby and Sir Roderick were festooning the hall with Holly, he saw Sir Roderick begin timidly with trembling shanks to climb some steps. He went to him, put his hand on his arm, and led him safely to ground again. I know you don't like ladders, he said. Some people can't stand them. I knew an old gentleman once terrified of ladders, and his eldest son, a bright, promising lad, must become a steeplejack. Only profession he had a liking for. Good heavens, cried Sir Roderick, paling. What a horrible pursuit. Whatever did his father do? Persuaded him to be a diver instead, said Mr. Huffam. The lad took to it like a duck to water. Up or down, it was all the same to him, he said. In fact, Mr. Huffam looked after Sir Roderick as a father his child. And before the day was out, the noble baronet was asking Mr. Huffam's opinion on everything. The right way to grow carnations, the gold standard, how to breed dachshunds, and the wisdom of Lord Beaverbrook. The gold standard and Lord Beaverbrook were new to Mr. Huffam, but he had his opinions all the same. Tubby, as he listened, could not help wondering where Mr. Huffam had been all these years. In some very remote South Sea island, surely. So many things were new to him. But his kindness and energy carried him forward through everything. There was much of the child about him, and much of the wise man of the world also. And behind these, a heart of melancholy, of loneliness. He has, it seems, thought Tubby, no home, no people, nowhere especially to go. And he had visions of attaching him to the family as a sort of secretarial family friend. Tubby was no sentimentalist about his own sex, but he had to confess he was growing very fond of Mr Huffam. It was almost as though he had known him before. There were, in fact, certain phrases, certain tones in the voice that were curiously familiar and reminded Tubby in some dim way of his innocent departed childhood. And then, after dinner, there was the conquest of Agatha Allington. Agatha had taken an instant dislike to Mr Huffam. She prided herself on her plain speech. Oh dear, she said to Lady Winslow, what a ruffian. He'll steal the spoons. I don't think so, said Lady Winslow with dignity. We like him very much. He seemed to perceive that Agatha disliked him. He sat beside her at dinner. He wore a tail coat of strange old-fashioned cut and carried a large gold fob. He was, as Tubby perceived, quite different from Agatha. He was almost, you might say, an old maid himself, or rather a confirmed old bachelor. He discovered that she had a passion for Italy. She visited Rome and Florence every year, and he described to her some of his own Italian journeys, taken many years ago, confessed to her that he didn't care for frescoes, which he described as dim virgins with mildewed glories. But Venice, ah, Venice, with its prisoners and dungeons and lovely iridescent waters. All the same, he was always homesick when he was out of London, and he described the old London to her, the fogs and the muffin bells and the growlers, and enchanted her with a story about a shy little bachelor and how he went out one evening to dine with a vulgar cousin and be kind to a horrible godchild. Indeed, they all listened, spellbound. Even Mallow stood with a plate in his hand and his mouth open, forgetting his duties. Then, after dinner, he insisted that they should dance. They made a space in the drawing room, brought up a gramophone, and set about it. Then how Mr Huffam laughed when Tubby showed him a one-step. Call that dancing, he cried. Then, humming a polka, he caught Agatha by the waist, and away they polkered. Then Lady Winslow, who had adored the polka once, joined in. Then the barn dance. Then, few though they were, Sir Roger. I know, Mr Huffam cried, we must have a party. A party? almost screamed Lady Winslow. What kind of a party? Why, a children's party, of course, on Christmas night. But we don't know any children. 
and children are bored with parties, and they'll all be engaged anyway. Not the children I'll ask, cried Mr Huffam. Not the party I'll have. It shall be the best party London has seen for years. It is well known that good-humoured, cheerful and perpetually well-intentioned people are among the most tiresome of their race. They are avoided by all wise and comfort-loving persons. Tubby often wondered afterwards why Mr Huffam was not tiresome. It was perhaps because of his childlikeness. It was also most certainly because of his intelligence. Most of all, it was because of the special circumstances of the case. In ordinary daily life, Mr Huffam might be a bore. Most people are at one time or another, but on this occasion, no one was a bore, not even Agatha. It was as though the front wall of the Hill Street house had been taken away and all the detail and incidents of these two days, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, became part of it. It seemed that Berkeley Square was festooned with crystal trees, that candles, red and green and blue, blazed from every window, that small boys, instead of chanting Good King Wenceslas in the usual excruciating fashion, carolled with divine voices, the processions of Father Christmases with snowy beards and red gowns marched from Selfridges and Harrods and Fortnums, carrying in their hands small Christmas trees, and even attended by reindeer, as though brown paper parcels tied with silver bands and decorated with robins fell in torrents through the chimney, and gigantic Christmas puddings rolled on their own stout bellies down Piccadilly, attended by showers of almonds and raisins. And upon all this, first a red-faced sun, then a moon, cherry-coloured and as large as an orange, smiled down upon a world of crusted, glittering snow, while the bells pealed, and once again the kings of the east came to the stable with gifts in their hands. Of course, it was not like that, but most certainly the Winslow house was transformed. For one thing, there was not the usual present giving. At breakfast on Christmas Day, everyone gave everyone else presents that must not, by order, cost more than sixpence apiece. Mr Huffam had discovered some marvellous things. Toy dogs that barked, Father Christmases glistening with snow, a small chime of silver bells, shining pieces of sealing wax. Then they all went to church at St James's Piccadilly. At the midday meal, Sir Roderick had turkey and Christmas pudding, which he hadn't touched for many a day. In the evening came the party. Tubby had been allowed to invite Diana. For the rest, the guests were to be altogether Mr Huffam's. No one knew what was in his mind. At 7.15 exactly came the first ring of the doorbell. When Mallow opened the portals, there on the steps were three very small children, two girls and a boy. Please, sir, this was the number the gentleman said, whispered the little girl, who was very frightened. Then, up Hill Street, the children came. Big children, little children, children who could scarcely walk, boys as bold as brass, Girls mothering their small relations, some of them shabby, some of them smart, some with shawls, some with mufflers, some with collars, some brave, some frightened, some chattering like monkeys, some silent and anxious, all coming up Hill Street, crowding up the stairs, passing into the great hall. It was not until they had all been ushered up the stairs by Mallow, where all in their places, that Sir Roderick Winslow barked, Lady Winslow his wife, Tubby Winslow, their son, were permitted to see their own drawing room. And when they did, they gasped with wonder. Under the soft and shining light, the great floor had been cleared. And at one end of the room, all the children were gathered. At the other end was the largest, the strongest, the proudest Christmas tree ever beheld. And this tree shone and gleamed with candles, with silver tissue, with blue and gold and crimson balls, and so heavily weighted was it with dolls and horses and trains and parcels 
that it was a miracle that, tree as it was, it could support its burden. So there it was, the great room shining with golden light, the children massed together, the gleaming floor like a sea, and only the cackle of the fire, the tick of the marble clock, the wandering whispers of the children for sound. A pause, and from somewhere or other, but no one knew whence, Father Christmas appeared. He stood there looking across the floor at his guests. Good evening, children, he said, and the voice was the voice of Mr. Huffam. Good evening, Father Christmas, the children cried in chorus. It's all his own money, Lady Winslow whispered to Agatha. He wouldn't let me spend a penny. He summoned them then to help with the presents. The children, who behaved with the manners of the highest of the aristocracy, even better than that, to be truthful, advanced across the shining floor. They were told to take turn according to size, the smallest first. There was no pushing, no cries of, I want that, as so often happens at parties, no greed and satiety. At last, the biggest girl, who was almost a giantess, and the biggest boy, who might have been a heavyweight boxing champion, received their gifts. The tree gave a little shiver of relief at its freedom from its burden, and the candles, the silver tissue, the red and blue and golden balls shook with a shimmer of pleasure because the present giving had been so successful. Games followed. Dubby could never afterwards remember what the games had been. They were no doubt hunt the slipper, kiss in the ring, cross your toes, last man out, blind man's buff, chase the cherry, here comes the elephant, count your blessings and all the other games. But Tubby never knew. The room was alive with movement, with cries of joy and shouts of triumph, with songs and kisses and forfeits. Tubby never knew. He only knew that he saw his mother with a paper cap on her head, his father with a false nose, Agatha beating a child's drum, and on every side of him, children and children and children, children dancing and singing and running and sitting and laughing. There came a moment when Diana, her hair dishevelled, her eyes shining, caught his arm and whispered, Tubby, you are a dear. Perhaps one day, if you keep this up, who knows? There was a sudden quiet. Mr. Huffam, no longer Father Christmas, arranged all the children round him. He told them a story, a story about a circus and a small child who, with her old grandfather, wandered into the company of those strange people, of the fat lady and the living skeleton, the jugglers and the beautiful creatures who jumped through the hoops, and the clown with the broken heart and how his heart was mended. And so they all lived happily ever after, he ended. Everyone said good night, and everyone went away. Oh dear, I am tired, said Mr. Huffam, but it has been a jolly evening. Next morning, when Rose the housemaid woke Lady Winslow with her morning cup of tea, she had startling news. Oh dear, my lady, the gentleman's gone. What gentleman? Mr. Huffam, my lady. His bed's not been slept in and his bag's gone. There isn't a sign of him anywhere. Alas, it was only too true. Not a sign of him anywhere. At least one sign only. The drawing room was as it had always been, every chair in its proper place. The copied old masters looking down solemnly from the dignified walls. One thing alone was different. The first edition of Martin Chuzzlewit in its handsome purpose binding, was propped up against the marble clock. How very strange, said Lady Winslow. But opening it, she found that on the flyleaf these words were freshly written. For Lady Winslow with gratitude, from her friend, the author. And under this, the signature, above a scrawl of thick black lines, Charles Dickens. It's a wonderful story, 
I'm quite surprised I haven't heard it before, but it appears in this wonderful compilation of glorious stories called The Sunless Solstice, edited by Lucy Evans and Tanya Kirk. I strongly recommend this book. It's full of treasures. Happy Christmas, everybody.